ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game number two between the Muslim and B. Spawning in on that south side of the map, playing as the Red Rus, we have got B. And on the northern side of the map, representing Team Liquid, it is going to be the Muslim playing as the English in blue. We talked about the civilization matchup a lot over here, but let's take a look at how the map looks like. And we gotta say, we have quite a lot of cliffs spawning, which is obviously going to make it even more favorable for the English here, make it much more defendable in this early mid-game period. Yeah, it can be a little bit weird with this map. Obviously, it, it can spawn open, but at the same time, it can spawn closed. Uh, and it, it seems to have been a bit of a closed spawn, so you would have to suggest that favors the Muslim. And keep in mind, the longer that this game does go on, especially once we start reaching towards that Imperial Age, it starts to get very difficult for the Rus. Uh, but uh, the Muslim will be pretty happy with the early game here. It's, uh, it's probably that timing around early castle, late feudal, where it starts to get better for B, though. Indeed, that is going to be one of the periods to look at, but this civilization matchup has a lot of interesting dynamics, right? Because the English player, of course, you can set up a very good farming eco at the beginning, try to go for that semi-fast castle approach to get yourself a second town center. On the other side, the Rus can easily get a second town center for themselves as well. It might even be possible that one player is trying to play with three town centers because they know that there is a likely possibility of both players going for two. So we have seen instances of that. I think it was... Uh, was it Don Ari? It, yeah, it, it was Papi Paul versus Don Ari yesterday, which was an Abbasid versus Rus matchup, where the Abbasid player decided to go for a third town center simply because they were aware that it's so standard to play two town centers with the Abbasids that the Rus are almost guaranteed to play two town centers as well. So if you want to build up a lead for yourself, you probably go for a third one. So I can even see that logic coming into play here for the Muslim. It's going to be interesting to see how the players approach this game here. And it looks like B is going to have just enough bounty for that tier 2. Pretty decent work over here on the Wolves. Yeah, I was watching the micro very closely there. Bean hit every single wolf there. It was beautifully done. Now, obviously, he had an advantage in that he had a second scout, but still, you can always try and take away the. Uh, you can always try and take away a uh, a, a wolf from your enemy. But uh, B paying a hundred percent attention there, and he's got picked up plenty of sheep out here as well. He's bringing back twelve sheep at the moment, so that'll be another sixty bounty on top of that. So he'll be up to at the very least three fifty. And keep in mind, there's two boars out on the map as well, which means there's a possibility that he does hit that 500 bounty. Speaking of boars, by the way, we do have one on the far right side of the map. That would be a very safe boar for B to work with. But if he wants to go aggro, there is a perfect boar in between the players. That is a super good boar in the middle. If you want to go for a proxy base, it might be a little too risky to go for it because it's so close to the base of the Muslim. But if you want to go for that full feudal aggression with the Rus, this is the perfect boar spot for you, especially because there is even a patch of deer right next to it. So... If B wants to play very aggressive, this map for him is perfect for it. Yeah, it, it's definitely a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Having the boar so close to your base, because obviously, as the English, you don't typically go for those boars in the early stages of the game. Uh, but one of the things that your enemy does is goes for the boar. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we do see some very aggro uh, position coming out here. Maybe a bit of an, a tower rush. Uh, we've, we've seen that uh, from B before. He does like to always throw a spanner in the mix, and I wouldn't be surprised if that is going to be the spanner he pulls out today. It's a possibility, and I actually wonder what landmark the Muslim will age up with, because the Muslim is one of the English players that loves to use the Abbey of the Kings out there. Looks like the boar is going to be taken on the right side, so B is taking the safer option, but... I have seen the Muslim reacting to Rus boar builds with the Abbey of Kings and a very heavy four horseman focused play. And indeed, there is the Abbey coming in for him. He's probably the number one player who loves to use, like, or more precisely, he's the player that has the highest probability of using the Abbey of Kings in professional or tournament games. Yeah, this is great to see. And I think what's so impressive to me is the fact that we, like, this isn't a meme. This is genuine. He is using the Abbey of the King or Abbey of Kings because he thinks it's the best wonder or best landmark for him in this situation. And that's that's so telling because neither of these guys are qualified yet for Red Bull Walla Lol. So both of them have got, you know, incredible amounts of stuff on the line right now. So really, really big. But we do see a bit of a scout micro coming in here. B going to be able to escape there with one of his scouts. And we've got villagers now beginning to move out for the Muslim. 
Yeah, the thing is that B doesn't have a tower up just yet, which allows the Muslim to potentially drop his own tower out there and just deny that boar straight away. These villagers, they have not been spotted by B just yet, and it looks like he might be oh. missing them. Oh, he's going to see them. The villagers have bows though. These are English villagers. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Let's go. He, he, can't, he can't even challenge it. He just because the problem is there's only, there's five villagers there, which is enough to two shot the villagers that he's got. So if B chases the villagers away, the problem is going to be that the Muslim is winning on villager seconds because he's going to need he'll be chasing away you know all of those five villagers with his eight villagers. We do see the first villager go down, and so now he's going to be looking to turn the table. But once again, we see the bows lock on. You can see him moving out, and boom. See you, mate. Oh, it manages to survive with three health. He mustn't have got the lock on that last one because th these bows do lock on once they've got their, their target, and indeed they do get the kill. We'll now continue making their way through. We can see another villager coming back with 21 health. He's trying to keep it in the stealth forest, doing a pretty decent job, but keep in mind that B has a knight in queue. We now see it coming out as well over towards this position. Looks like Demus is going to have to fall back away from this, but uh, keep in mind he is still cognizant of an outpost potentially getting thrown down. Oh man, this is something I hate so much in the English villagers. It can be so frustrating to deal with, just villagers being bold and killing your own villagers. And you could see that B went for that boar early. He went for a hunting cabin prior to dropping the tower over here, and he didn't even have a single knight to support those villagers with. He didn't seem to expect those villagers coming in, but he might find some retaliation over here, because the first knight is on his way. On the other side, though, the Muslim does have the horseman, and keep in mind, any damage that you take on those knights with the ruse is permanent as compared to the Muslim, who can just go back and heal up the low HP uh, horseman that he has. Yeah, that knight gonna be coming out now. It's just to the south of our screen. I think it's just taking a little bit of a snooze right now. There it is, now gonna be coming out, charging straight towards those villagers. And that's the second villager that goes down there for the Muslim. And the rest of the villagers will shortly be cleaned up as well. Now, you mentioned that there was a horseman somewhere out on this field. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but the knight heads off back to where... <laughs> I hate it when they do that. I don't know why they do it, but the cavalry in particular love to do that. They will kill one unit and they'll be like, all right, well, I'm heading back over to the hunting cabin. Uh, I was rallied out here, so I'm just going to chill there. They don't bother with the rest of the units. Now, you sitting back at home, fellow viewers, might be wondering why was this worth it for the Muslim? He's going to lose some of his villagers. In fact, you see the villager count. It's actually going to drop below B's villager count. But take a look at the top right side. That food income for B was down to like 30 food per minute. He had a lot of town center idle time because of this one. He's also going to lose a couple more villagers. And the key word here is accessibility of food. His entire idea was to take that boar and base his food eco around it. With that being gone and inaccessible, suddenly he finds himself in a position where he doesn't have professional scouts to ferry in deer, and he's probably depleting those berries under the town center very rapidly. In fact, I would love to see how many um, sheep carcasses he still has left under that town center. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got to agree with you. I'm really liking the position here from Demuslim. It, it's such a smart play the way that he's managed to pull this out. Sure, he did lose a few villagers in there. We, if we look at the villager count now, B is up by a villager. But uh, I, I still feel like the longer this game goes on uh, for, for this point, that it starts to, to peak for the English player. Especially if you look at those resources, because one of the things that the Muslim is also accomplishing with this one is causing chaos. You completely derail the build order of B. We have no idea what exactly B tried to do in this game, because his build order was completely smashed by this build or by this play by the Muslim. And if you take a look yeah. at the Muslim, he's following this up with Castle Age. Yeah, well, we see the castle age, but we also see B going for a, a second town center. It's coming out in the middle as well. This is something that we've seen a few players do where they look to drop a town center down on the ball as a... Uh, it, instead of going for a hunting cabin and a wooden fortress, you can just throw a town center down as well. It's basically the same amount of wood. I mean, it's not exactly, but it's it's about 100 wood short. So it's it's not a bad play. And especially knowing that Demuslim is going up to that castle age as well, it is uh, it is it's going to be guaranteeing that he's keeping up in the economy. Yeah, that's a very nice town center actually, because remember that is actually right next to the boar. So he now has the boar, he now has a big gold, and he now has two berry patches. So the food issues we talked about, he managed to resolve it with that town center. The question now becomes, how is he going to deal with the costlage knights that will be coming in? Especially because that's where that Abbey of Kings really comes online. That's where you can really heal up those very expensive and high HP valuable units. 
Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. But now those horsemen are going to have to fall back. He's actually done a pretty decent job to keep all of those on quite low health. He manages to scoot them all out. Take a look at that. We've got a lot of low health horsemen in there. They're all going to be able to pick up some nice healing there. So starting to get some early value from that Abbey of Kings. That's at least three horsemen that he's bringing up to full health there. In the meantime, though, B actually killed the, uh, killed the boar in front of the Muslim's base. You could see it at the right edge of the screen with those knights. So he's now up to 500 bounty. You can see it at the bottom left. So he has unlocked tier 3. The Muslim now on the way to Castle Age. He's behind by a couple of villagers, but of course, he does have the advantage of the English farming. He already has his farming eco well set up, and he's getting ready for those Castle Age knights. The question becomes, how is B going to defend against that one? Because at some point, he has to find his way up to Castlage, and that could be difficult if he continues to go for so many knights. Yeah, I, th I think it, sh it should be okay for him trading these these Castle Age Knights, or his Feudal Age Knights into Castle Age Knights. The issue, as you mentioned, is the Abbey of Kings. That's really where it's going to start setting it apart. And I think it's so smart by the Muslim to be going for this landmark, because it basically makes it so that he's got French Knights. Obviously, he has to come back to his base to heal, but he heals up much faster than those French Royal Knights do. Those French Royal Knights, I think they're one health every second is what they tick up, whereas the Abbey of Kings heals up every uh, six health every second, I, I believe it is. Might be six health every one and a half seconds. It's a little bit weird. Yeah, um, they also had uh, done some changes on that landmark, so the healing rate was increased. So this Abbey is not the same Abbey that you could experience um, upon release. So it became a little bit more viable, and that healing rate increase makes it much more viable for the Muslim to just use it to heal up his valuable units. But yeah, this is something that the Muslim has done really well so far, keeping his low HP units alive, because in order for you to heal them up, you need to keep them alive, and that is actually very micro-intensive and very difficult to do. Yeah, that's a big factor. It's part of the reason why at, at sort of the lower level, Abbey of Kings wouldn't be that useful. But up, up at this higher level where people have got APMs starting to reach, you know, around that 400 mark, that's when, you know, it, it becomes very rare that people make the mistake of forgetting about their army for a second or two. And a person like the Muslim's always going to be paying attention. And now he turns around and he's going to be careful here, though, because you can see that B knows he's got that, uh, he's got that Abbey of Kings. So he looks to try and take out that first knight unsuccessful with the swoop. And as a result, it means that knight is going to be able to get away, but he's going to get a nice little surround on the back knight. Back knight continuing to come in. And once again, going to be coming back and healing up. So beautiful little trade right there for the Muslim. And slowly but steadily, it's these little battles that he wins that help go towards that war. That's exactly it. And this is difficult for B to deal with because he could take the best ever fight. If he can't kill a single unit, all of those units will get their HP back up. So in the last, let's say two or three minutes, B has done zero damage on the enemy army in reality. And that is concerning because you have taken substantial amount of damage. Many of those knights from B are now heavily damaged. And behind this one, the knight numbers are increasing for the Muslim, he's up to six. On the other side, we do have 11 knights here for B and he's getting ready for Castle Age. So things are not super grim for him either, but he still has to keep in mind that the Muslim is reaching the critical mass of knights where he can consider diving under that right hand side town center, for instance, and getting five or six villager picks, then disengaging and healing the knights back up and rinse and repeat. Yeah, well, speaking of engaging, it looks like those knights are going to be jumping underneath this town center. There's a lot of villagers here. The consequence of not dropping that wooden fortress means that you've got no space for these villagers, and they're going to be running around in circles now. But a whole bunch of knights coming back for B, looking to hold onto this position. Only a couple knights remaining underneath that town center, but it does look like B is going to be able to keep some of those villagers alive for the most part. He does seem to get chased around this larger gold mine out towards this eastern position on the map. And now falls back towards that town center where he's got a bit more of covering fire. Yeah, very nice micro over here for B. He barely lost a single villager to this one. On the other hand, he's losing most of his knights over here. Those knights did not get the castleage upgrades yet because B is still working his way towards castleage. Bit of an overly ambitious fight here potentially though for the Muslim taking a fight under the town center that's fully stacked with villagers. And he doesn't even have the first range defense upgrade. So the damage output coming out of that town center is quite substantial. But it feels like he could do some damage over here to the food eco just by idling it. But I don't think it's actually doing enough damage here. B is taking some really good engagements over here, helped out massively by the town center fire. Yeah, that was a great engagement for B. I'm sure he's going to be really happy with how that went. It was it was very scary. A lot of people might have looked at that and wondered why the heck Hydrate was the Muslim house. taking that. Yeah, only 120 gold though, so not the best, not the not your impressive world record 
uh, typical high trade house that you, you see. It works out to be about one relic. Um, but yeah, I guess the interesting thing to note there is the Muslim knew that if he won that fight, that the prize are villager kills. And unfortunately for him, he didn't win that fight. So he didn't get to pick up those villager kills. And we do see that B has still got a pretty decent villager lead here. And he's now going to begin to start picking up relics as well. Indeed, one thing that we need to consider is that even if the Muslim kills a couple of villagers over there, it's not really worth, let's say, killing five villagers for a price of six, seven nights. So you have to be very considerate of those fights. The Muslim felt like he had the critical mass to just kill those villagers, but B had more reinforcements coming in. That probably was the key factor. The Muslim, when he started the engagement, he didn't see the new reinforcements come in, and by the time he noticed, it was just too late. He took the fight, lost it. Still, he's up to nine knights, so his numbers aren't terrible, and he is the first player to pick up the first relic over here, something that's very important to look at in a Rus matchup, simply because the Rus player is going to be rather rapid picking up those relics. Yeah, it looks like the knight's going to be falling in underneath the town center. It looks like maybe a villager or two did go down there. There's still six inside, so he's managed to keep the majority of them alive. That villager looks like it might be going down, though. Unfortunate timing on that one. It does have its textiles in. We see another villager down towards the south, and, uh, and those knights are going to be pushed out of the base. B got the knight superiority at the moment. Uh, now, one of the things that I'd like to talk about is just that high trade house. A lot of people might be wondering exactly why we see the high trade house out here. It's actually a pretty smart decision from B to go into this. So first and foremost, he's guaranteed that he has got that 120 gold in. So we'll just leave it at that. But the big thing here is that Demuslim was up to the Castle Age quite a fair bit before him, which means that Demuslim, obviously being a top level player and also playing the English, he's going to want to be picking up those relics. So it's going to mean that there's less relics out on the map there for B to take. So B's response, instead of going for the Abbey of the Trinity, which he would have to do in his base, and then he'd have to wait for them to cut for the warrior monks to come out, and then they'd have to walk across the entire map, is just to simply drop that monastery in a forward location. And it saves a fair bit of time there as well. So I think it's a pretty smart move for him to do that. Uh, he's not going to lose a lot out of it. Uh, and in fact, I I'd say it's probably the right decision here. I agree with you. As you pointed out, you essentially are guaranteed one relic with that high trade house. And given the fact that you were quite a bit behind compared to your opponent into Castle Age, you expect your opponent to be pretty active pricking up relics. And honestly, that assessment is correct. You see, the Muslim already has a third relic being brought in. So if B went for the Abbey, he would probably be capped out at like two relics at best. With this, he is probably going to have two relics as well, but. He's also going to have that passive gold generation for the high trade house, which also supplies him with an infinite amount of deer, which means he needs to add way less farms in the long run. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of people do often overlook that deer uh, coming in. But the night number is now starting to look pretty healthy here for B. We do see that the Muslim is adding in crossbows. And I think this is such a smart move in just knowing how this matchup plays out. We do see it keep coming down for the Muslim as well. And with that, it's going to look to extend out the game even further. Remember, the longer this game goes, the more likely it becomes that the Muslim wins it. Uh, at this stage in the game, you would have to say the advantage goes over to B when it comes to the, the power spikes of these civilizations. But slowly and steadily, the Rus player will run out of steam in the late game compared to the English. Indeed, the Rus is on a bit of a timer over here. And one of those timers, though, could be Boyar's Fortitude, one of the most powerful Castle Age upgrades out there, which would buff those knights quite a bit. And that would give an edge in battle for B as compared to the enemy knights. Because right now, as you could see, he was repelled by superior numbers of the Muslim. But if he gets Boyar's Fortitude, which is a very gold-heavy upgrade, by the way, so that's not something that B can afford right now. But when he gets that upgrade, his knights will be substantially better than the enemy knights here from the Muslim. So the Muslim has to preemptively respond to that. He needs to assess that problem. He needs to make sure that when that upgrade comes in, his units also contain, or like his army also contains units that are not just purely knights because knight v knight, he would lose the battle. Another great choice from the Muslim here as well. So we've talked about landmark choices for B with the Muslim going for the Abbey of Kings. One of the big factors is if you go for the Abbey of Kings, you don't have access to the Council Hall. They are mutually exclusive. But the Council Hall can only make longbows. And now we start to see the Muslim making crossbows. So even if he'd gone for that Council Hall, he still wouldn't have used it at any point. And now even in this transition point, he wouldn't have used it. But we do see the, the Knights beginning to come through. I think those crossbows on the back line mean that B is just going to have to fall back. He knows that he can't really hold a, a, a strong position here with those crossbows out. They're going to be providing too much damage. But it looks like B slowly but steadily going to be looking to group around. The village is going to be coming out. Crossbows on the backside going to be able to provide so much damage here and just slice through that armor. And we can see that the Muslim is looking very strong. Slowly and steadily, the reinforcements are coming in for B. He's trying his best to clean this up, but unfortunately, the Muslim just doing a very strong job. And we can see now that the Wallalo are going to be coming in. He's going to be careful to fall back here. 
He's got to wake up and manages to do that. The monk is going to go down with the relic on the ground, but those crossbows continuing to push up. And this is what really makes the difference here. Just those six crossbows on the backside enabled the Muslim to carry that fight so damn well. You can have lower night numbers. It doesn't matter because you've got that extra damage coming out from the pocket. And the network of Seldal's bonus shouldn't be overlooked either. This is so well streamlined for the Muslim. Look at the lineup of towers he has. He has network of castles increasing his attack rate for the entire battle. And for half of the battle, he has already gotten the network of Seldal's bonus because he built an early keep. On that keep, you can research Network of Cyrodiil's, which is going to boost your attack rate even more. Now he's even yoinking the Relic out there, and that boost with the English, combined with the crossbows and the knights, is just a deadly combination against everything that B has on the battlefield. Oh. Looks like... <laughs> Wow, that was nice. The, the, the dying wish of the Wooden Fortress was to kill the monk that yoinked the Relic. And indeed, it does take it out. But the question is for how long, because that's a, that's quite a decent position that the Muslim's got there. I don't think he's going to be able to take back that relic. Yeah, and like this lineup of towers makes it very difficult for B to counterattack because you simply can't fight underneath English towers. Not even with the network of castles bonus active, but when you get that network of Citadel's buff, it becomes insanely deadly. Like 50% attack rate boost on these units is unbelievably powerful, especially for costly age armies. And especially when you technically have the direct counter unit to everything that B has on the battlefield, B only has knights, so even without that boost, the crossbow knight composition of the Muslim would win, but with that boost, it's even more powerful, and you see the Muslim, he's actually banking up a ton of resources, makes me wonder if he's actually thinking about Imperial Age over here. Yeah, he could definitely do it. And this matchup, trebuchets don't really play a huge... Um, they don't really play a, a huge part of this matchup. It's not like you're, the matchup against China where you need trebuchets to deal with the bombards. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually saw a, a forward Berkshire Palace coming down. Yeah, I was thinking about the same thing, actually, because um, you don't want to drag this game out very long. You don't want to go for that Wingard Palace out there. If you want to play a long game, you can go Wingard, but with the playstyle that the Muslim is showing right now, all these forward towers fortifying all of them, if he goes into Imperial, a forward Barkshire seems to make more sense. He's also yoinking that Relic right now, and he's got enough stone for another keep. Looks like it's not even gonna be Imperial, he just wants to finish this game in Castle. Yeah, he's doing really well, continuing to push up with those outposts. He's going to be careful not to lose these knights as they do get surrounded. The knight number is starting to look pretty decent for B. He's up to 24 knights. Now going to continue surrounding. Ideally, he needs to add in a couple of horsemen here just to deal with these crossbows, but instead going to be looking to get a nice little surround on the crossbows, and unfortunately, nothing to scream here for the bows. They're going to continue trying to make their escape towards the north, but unfortunately, there are a lot of knights here but also a lot of Sprinkle Towers, plus the attack rate boost of the Muslim as well. Now new knights are now coming in for the Muslim. Numbers are still massive here for B, but I'm not sure how long he can sustain engagements under so many Sprinkle Towers. Looks like he's going to clean up most of the crossbowmen, but the losses are astronomical on his side as well. And this is still playing right into the hands of the Muslim because I don't know if B can launch another counterattack like that. Whereas for the Muslim, his fourth position right now is still very strong. Yeah, you might think things, things are looking very good for B at the moment. I mean, he's up 14 villages. The knight numbers are pretty decent. He's going to be able to take out this trebuchet as well. And with this, he's going to be able to turn the attention over towards the opposite side of the map. Now, that's on the condition that he's actually able to push through. And we do see that villagers manage to spot each other up towards that northern side. Stone walls also coming up for the Muslim. But B might be getting a nice little push coming through here in the middle. Yeah, we may have underestimated his capabilities to come back over here with the unit composition that he has. This being said, knights here on the front line are getting evaporated now by the crossbows. He decided to take that engagement. New reinforcements are coming in, but if the Muslim is able to regroup, it's going to be a completely different story. And you see so many Springo towers out here. It's very difficult for B to take those fights under those. Even one or two Springo towers could do a ton of damage, but four or five of them just decimate your knights. And now these villagers also get found over here. I'm not sure how good B's farm transition is, by the way, and that could be a source of concern. Beautiful quick walls, though, from him to save those villagers. Yeah, quick walls coming in towards that position, but unfortunately, as as you mentioned, B has bled out quite a bit from those sprinkled emplacements, and that's what makes them so strong. But it looks like up towards the north, we've got ourselves a little bit of a wall in. It ain't the fact that you're stuck in here with me, mate. I am stuck in here with you. At least that's what the Muslim says to B, because we've got that outpost coming up for him. But uh, yeah, at this point, the Muslim obviously looking pretty damn good. 
Oh yeah, you don't want to be stuck together with English villagers. It's not gonna work out for you like that, that's for sure. And you see the spring water might actually find an angle on those villagers as well on the hunt. A lot of food could be denied here from B and we could see his base for a brief moment. He doesn't have a ton of farms. Access to food could be a concern. And now the Muslim is looking to finish this game over here. Villagers are being pulled for a forward castle. I don't think like if B doesn't stop that, it's probably gonna be game over. Yeah, it's very difficult for me to stop it in this position because I don't think we've seen any siege out from him in this game. And as a result, it means he's going to have to drop that siege work. He's going to have to get out the first trebuchet, the second trebuchet, and then finally a third trebuchet. And by then, you're probably going to see an English in Imperial or, you know, an English in a, in a very decent spot. But now those knights are going to be coming in, forcing those villagers back, crossbows in the mix as well. More than enough here as well to run a screen. Those knights are going to be A-OK. -okay. And things are starting to look up for the Muslim B, unfortunately. Didn't bring all the knights to the party, and it means that he's going to have to fall back from that position. Sprangle Towers are so, so powerful over here. Not one, but like four or five of them. They just massacre all those knights, especially when you have crossbowmen support over here. And that keep is going up for the Muslim. That's also going to act as a forward seat workshop, so you can start adding trebuchets immediately. Start shelling those uh, starting town centers, the landmarks as well. And half of the farming eco that B has is also going to be exposed to that castle. I don't think he can stop this. And then I don't know how he's going to just stop the push deep into his base. Yeah, well, the Muslims made up the village difference now. We've got a 98 versus 98 villager difference. Knights underneath the town center are going to get cleaned up here by B. He's going to be happy with this. Uh, but the first trebuchet is actually out. We do see it has begun to roll off the shelf. Second trebuchet is in queue at the moment. So at least has the building blocks for a response here. And B is definitely holding on to try and fight for his life here. Obviously, it is uh, his tournament life in this first weekly event on the line here, match point for the Muslims, so B is not going to tap out of this one easily, but his food income per minute is actually dropping quite dramatically. It was like 2,000 per minute just a couple of minutes ago, now it's down to 560. And he doesn't have a ton of farms, obviously, he does have that hydrate house at the back, but his access to food is now going to be limited and he's running out of gold on the right hand side as well. With both of his starting gold mines being on the front, currently being denied by the Muslims, so access to resources is going to be a source of concern very soon for B here. Yeah, it looks like he's got a couple of knights up here trying to secure this. He's going to be looking to take this gold in the middle. Uh, but my fear are those Springle Towers for the English player. So we'll have to see exactly how it goes. Oh, now those Boyer's knights are going to be clean. Just now. Only just now Boyas Fortitude coming in at 27 minutes. You can't help but feel that that's a little bit of a mistake there from B. Unfortunate for him. Typically, you'd expect to see this coming out before 20 minutes. Or before you take massive engagements with your knights. I think that was the bigger problem. He probably couldn't afford it, but he desperately needed that in those fights in the middle. And if he had it, it would be a completely different scenario. He had like 30 knights. That extra buff on the HP would have made it much more difficult for the Muslim to deal with that. Might even have made that counterattack a lot more dangerous than what it was. Yeah, yeah, it definitely would have. Uh, and it means that things like when those sprinkled emplacements are firing off, that your knights are surviving for a little bit longer. They get off a few more hits. They're able to take out more units. So it really does make a big difference. Uh, but now we start to see trebuchets also coming out for the Muslim, looking to take down that outpost, supporting that gold mine. Village account starting to look in the favor of the Muslim. He's up by about five villages at the moment. Upgrades coming through for him as well. Uh, both players have got pretty much all of their economic upgrades at the moment, uh, with the exception of the Muslim, who's are coming in at the moment. But uh, now a whole bunch of knights for the Muslim. Look to fall back. Crossbows continuing to come out. There's a decent mass of crossbows here. Now B has got three mangonels out on the map. So it means that he does have a response to these crossbows, but he's going to need to wait for them. They're slow. They're immobile. And they are very, very strong. Though. Yeah, like that is the only hope that B has right now. If he can land a couple of nice mangonel hits, there might be still a glimpse of hope for him. Here come the mangonels, and the Muslim doesn't have a single Springle out there. This is the first time he's spotting them, though, and he might find an angle with the knights. There's a lot of villagers here to repair. If you ever were worried about <laughs> villager repair rate, then do not worry anymore. But the mangonels get a Ooh. big shot off on those crossbows. Looks like a handful of mangonels or ha handful of crossbows do go down. One of the mangonels on the backside does go down, but now that mangonel going to continue firing off towards the range units. We see plenty of lances or rather knights continuing to come out, and it looks like it might be a decent hole here. 4B managing to keep himself alive, singing like the Bee Gees, but it might only be for a short amount of time. That keep did go down on the front. Things aren't looking terrible now for our Rus player. Given the circumstances, this is actually looking really good for him. He just took an amazing fight, wiping out most of the Muslim's army. The Muslim is down to 23 military population, some of that just being trebuchets. He lost that forward keep, 
and B is recovering from this one. This is still a long way to go for him, so the Muslim is still in a great spot here, I feel. But B has done the first couple of steps he needed to do to make sure that he drags this game out and gives himself a recovery chance. Villagers now moving in onto the Mangonel. We take a look at the repair rate and, and make mild comments about how there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But unfortunately, the villagers weren't paying attention. Neither was I because that second Mangonel went down instead. Very smart move there from the Muslim. Yeah, indeed, very smart move. He noticed that the first Mangonel was being repaired, so he immediately switched focus to the second one because that's the only thing that you can do right now against 20 villagers repairing, trying to make sure that you can click the enemy Mangonel faster than your opponent can click it to repair it. And that's exactly what happened over there. So the Muslim takes down one of those. But behind this one, the Muslim's army getting wiped out from the battlefield once again. He's down to 10 knights, 17 crossbows still on the battlefield for him. The question now becomes, how is B getting rid of all those forward towers? Because that's gonna be a big part of the equation out there. Well, he's got three trebuchets on the backside and they're continuing to funnel down upon this. We can see the single trebuchet out for the Muslim is just trying to work its magic, but unfortunately those traps are gonna be completely outnumbered. But now we actually see a, uh, a bit of a knife push down on these traps and it's gonna be actually taking out two of them. The third one might potentially go down in here. Village is not being pulled to that trebuchet and both or all three of those traps go down, which is gonna stall out the push for a massive amount of time. And that is a lot of resources going down the drain. We talked about this one piece, constrained on resources, so you can't afford to lose three trebuchets like that, because not only are you losing precious time, time that you would need to clean up those towers, you're also losing a ton of resources. And behind this one, the Muslim still has a large gold to the north that he just now started mining, so he's not going to run out of gold very soon. And what's more important is that he's working his way towards Imperial now. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I would be surprised at this point to see him actually go for that Barkshire Palace just because he has lost that foothold on the front. And that even if you were to get it up, your enemy's already got all the tools that they need to deal with it. So trebuchets are going to be the only unit in the game that actually outranges that Barkshire Palace. But we do now see that age up coming through. It is going to be the Wingard Palace that gets dropped down. It's in the back of the base. It's nice and safe. So I would expect that uh, with that, the slow and steady push is going to begin from our English player. So what, what kind of composition are you thinking in the late game? You thinking some hand cannoneers are going to be coming out here for the Muslim? That would be extremely powerful. It's a very population efficient unit. And with the 50% attack boost on the network of Citadel's bonus, those hand cannoneers are devastating. Like we have seen instances of that yesterday even. Hand cannoneers are a completely different entity when you do have that extra attack boost on them makes the crossbows completely obsolete. So, yeah, I agree with you. Hand cannoneers could be a great choice. I can see elite knights being part of the equation as well because you want to maintain your mobility, your high mobility component, your screen, uh, screening component for your army. So I can see a combination of elite knights and hand cannoneers being a thing. Technically, you could even consider men at arms over here. Those are very tanky units as well for the English. Let's take a look at that landmark. That is one of the most beautiful landmarks in the game you will ever see. Uh, that, that Wingard Palace. But never mind that. We got ourselves a little bit of a battle on the front side now. Mangadel's going to be unfolding three of them. Take out those villagers on the gold mine. Everybody is going down. There is a party right now. But unfortunately, only the Rus player is invited because all of the English villagers, as well as their units, have been killed. And Dubuza finds himself in a difficult spot because he's on 11 military population and B is on 55. Yeah, that's exactly it. B is realizing that he will never get into Imperial, so the best thing he can do is go for a timing push against the English player, and right now the Muslim doesn't have anything to defend his base with. He's got 30 knights, he's trying to go for the elite upgrade, he's also adding some more crossbows. He has quite a lot of production behind though, and suddenly we are seeing an uptick in the knight numbers, so it looks like most of his resources were just in queue. 11 stables as you can see on the overlay, and look at that production, and also the upgrades coming in, including tight barns out there. B the Muslim? If he can buffer this up for like one or two minutes, I think he's going to have the critical mass to defend against this counterattack from B. Yeah, the Muslim doing the right thing, though, drawing the forces away from his own base. So it, it, what the, the primary thing that B could have done in that position is, is move forward for a castle drop and also push forward with his own units. And that's going to help against those knights. But fortunately, the Muslim picks up that, hold on, I'm in a bit of a difficult spot here. I need to turn the attention towards my enemy's side. That's exactly what he does. And he draws away these forces. So great job by him. Doesn't just let himself get steamrolled down the center. Instead, takes that steamroller and tears it apart. Yeah, that's exactly it. If you need to buy yourself some time, it's a great way to obtain it by just going for a counterattack. You go for a counterattack, you draw away some of these forces, slow down his push against your base, buy yourself some time to get those knights on the battlefield, and now we're talking about 25 elite knights versus the 32 knights that B has. B, of course, still has very powerful castle age knights over here, but the Muslim 
Shadow having his eco fueled by the enclosures upgrade as well for the passive gold income. He can just keep spamming knights over here. And soon we're also going to see some spearmen being added to the mix, some crossbows, as you can see at the top of the screen. And I feel like B, for him, the window is closing, especially because he's running out of gold. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a really big factor here. And keep in mind, he doesn't actually have the relics. He hasn't taken the sacred sites either. He's had this one sitting up towards the north for plenty of time and has just never taken it. So it's uh, it's a difficult position for him. And those is that elite crossbows we've got out there as well. So not even bothering to stop with hand cannoneers. He says, you know what? I'm just going to go straight into crossbows. They work a little bit better with the economy. And that's exactly what he's done here. So smart moves from him. But uh, now going to be forced back from this position. Trebuchet unfolding on the back line. Villagers also moving up, looking to drop down another outpost on the front side, trying to rebuild. Uh, that is what he's doing. But now B, he's looking to go H for himself. We can see there's plenty of resources stacked up in the backside now. But still those knights, it's the only unit he seems to know how to make with the exception of the mangonel, the trebuchet. <laughs> he's only been making knights this game. Yeah, he's very heavily focused on those knights out there, but now you see the Imperial unit composition for the Muslim winning over it. He still has reasonable knights on the battlefield. He also has quite a lot of crossbows now in all with the Imperial Age upgrades, and the Muslim has 2,000 stone in the bank, so he could go for a forward keep at any moment. And you see B, now his eco is exposed over here. The Lumberjacks, the gold miners, are exposed to the army of the Muslim. I don't think B can reach Imperial here, and he just can't sustain fighting against an Imperial Age army with only cast Age units here for a long time. Yeah, it was a really nice try here from B. Uh, I, I would have loved to have seen like just a couple of horsemen out as well because they're very effective against those crossbowmen. But unfortunately, it looks like he's going to get completely rolled over here. He's trying his best to do a bit of a last stand, but the numbers for the Muslim are just going to continue barreling down the center as he actually starts making some horsemen of his own. And indeed, the horseman is just a transition to that uh, less gold-heavy cavalry unit that you will use for raiding here, because the Muslim is aware of the fact that gold is going to become a luxury commodity for both players here, despite the fact that you do have four relics and the enclosures, and B knows that he can't stop this force. The Muslim takes game number two as well, and with that, moves into the semifinals of the first weekly event of Road to Vololo. Very impressive performance there from the Muslim. 2-0 up against B. B, obviously an incredibly good player. Uh, typically seen as a, a bit of a kryptonite as well for the Muslim. Uh, so it's a, a, a great outcome for, the, for him. He's going to be really happy with his performance there. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was, that was a great game. And we got to see the Abbey of Kings come out. Did it get a lot of use? But I think it was a big threat, though, wasn't it? It was just, you know, the, the fact that there was always the chance that there could be a, a big heel coming off. Indeed, and now we're going back and taking a look at the other matches because we do have some updates over here. 